Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me as President of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow to welcome you all to the 2013 McEwen Lecture. This will be delivered by Professor Andrew Bianchin. I am delighted with this choice since, as many of you know, Professor Biankin has recently taken up the post of Regis Professor of Surgery at the University of Glasgow, without doubt one of the most prestigious chairs in the United Kingdom. When many of our young doctors are at least on a temporary basis heading for Australia, it is gratifying to see this process reversed and at such a senior level. This part of Scotland indeed has much to offer as reflected in the hosting of the 2014 Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup. In the opposite direction, we also have next month the visit of the British and Irish Lions to Andrew's homeland. May I predict a host of medals for Scotland in the Commonwealth Games, a European win in the Ryder Cup, and with apologies to Andrew, a clean sweep for the Lions. I make no secret of the fact that I am a physician and representing the surgical side of the house has been illuminating to say the least. I was fascinated by the term surgeon scientist and as part of my steep learning curve, I know now that surgeon scientist is by no means a contradiction of words. Our lecturer today is a distinguished surgeon scientist as indeed are many of those who have previously delivered this lecture. Indeed, it would be appropriate to use that term for Sir William McEwen, who also held the position of Regis Professor of Surgery at the University of Glasgow. Andrew is a graduate of the University of New South Wales and completed his training by 1998. His research has focused on the molecular biology of pancreatic cancer. Following his PhD, he continued his research at Johns Hopkins and returned to Australia in 2005 to head up pancreatic cancer research at the Garvin. Andrew's research, while at a molecular level, has bridged very effectively to identifying novel biomarkers of prognosis and response to therapy. He truly is an international figure in surgery, and I can think of no one more suited to deliver this year's McEwen Lecture, the title of which is Entering the Molecular Age of Surgical Oncology. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Andrew Biankin. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunn. It's a distinct honor and a pleasure to address you today about some of the work we've been doing, really as a basis for where we're trying to move in the future. Um, apart from the, uh, the victory against Australia, which I still have mixed feelings about, I support all the other, all the other Scottish, Scottish initiatives. In fact, my son has a, has a uh, Scottish kit. He doesn't have an Australian kit, so... Uh, we're certainly moving in that direction. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is really where we're trying to use modern molecular tools to really inform what we do for patients. We're very much in a transition of how we approach patient care, moving away from what were indirect measures of patient's disease to more precise measures. This has been enabled not just through ways of thinking, but also through advancement of technologies. So I'll start to walk you through some of our early work where we tried to address specific questions of importance. We did this in pancreatic cancer uh, for a number of reasons. Pancreatic cancer is perhaps um, the deadliest of cancers. Um, very, it's a very humbling disease. Yeah. Haven't really made any progress 
When I first started speaking about pancreatic cancer, I said 30 years, but now I have to say 45 or almost 50 because not much progress has been made. But we have new drugs over the last six, nine, 18 months. We have some new drugs we can choose from, but there are certain impediments in getting that across to uh, you know, public health sense. The average survival, even with treatment, remains about six months. A lot of patients don't get treatment. Um, as Dave Tuverson was mentioning yesterday, they, they're very sick when they arrive, and as a consequence, you make them a lot sicker and you can kill them with any sort of treatment that you do. Surgery does work, and I'll show you some data about that. Um, but ke chemotherapy is modestly effective, and modestly, I use that as a kind term, really, it doesn't work, but it does work in individual subgroups. And this is part of the basis of, of thinking of how we approach uh, disease in general in a stratified or in a personalized way using uh, mo molecular tools to inform us on how to do that. Unfortunately, only a small proportion of patients are suitable for resection and only about a small 20% of those manage to survive for five years. We have no ability to predict that before we operate on these patients. We use some indirect measures such as imaging. Um, but really, we don't understand the biology as well as we understand the biology of many other cancers. And in fact, to a certain degree, as I'll show, the biology of pancreatic cancer to a certain degree is different to others. It's reminiscent of basal breast cancer, which is difficult to treat, mainly because it's such a, a mix or a heterogeneous or a complex disease. So what do, do, what do we do for pancreatic cancer you know, with regard to, uh, to an algorithm or a flow and a way of thinking about the disease? First of all, when a patient presents with pancreatic cancer, we, we try and assess them, we stage them, we try and stage their disease. And really the key decision is, is this person a candidate for operation or are they not? Do they have metastatic disease? Are they locally advanced? How can we better inform that using other tools? And so when we, we move further and further between local regional disease and metastatic disease, um, then we also have to make some key decisions there as well about selection for chemotherapy, whether or not we use radiotherapy. And as I'll, I'll show you as we move forward, because it's such a diverse disease, any clinical trials we've done in the past have really been underpowered to detect any differences. And it's changing the paradigm of cancer care and in fact chronic disease care um, uh, across the planet. So when we image a patient, we assess them for, uh, for resection, we try and get a feeling for their disease and start them on a stage-specific disease um, uh, pathway, we use very indirect measures or surrogates of biology. We'll scan people um, look, looking for masses, we'll, we'll do an EUS, sometimes we'll do a PET scan, depending upon the local environment, we decide whether uh, we, can, we can go ahead and operate or whether we can't uh, perform an operation in that circumstance. Do we have data that supports that surgery works? I'm thankful that the debate as to whether we should operate on patients with pancreatic cancer is now quietened down. Um, the argument that it is all a systemic disease is not correct, but certainly a high proportion of it is. And so the best data we probably have is from the C registry. Of course, we don't have a prospective randomized trial for this, but these are stage one patients with surgery and equivalent stage one patients without surgery. And you can see there is certainly some efficacy there. But nonetheless, we still have this early failure rate. We're not really helping these patients a lot. A lot of this early failure is metastatic. In fact, 80 plus percent of it is metastatic. And so the co what we're really thinking about is a cult metastatic disease. The disease is there, we just can't see it. Can we detect that disease better and avoid surgery in those patients where they're not going to benefit and being more aggressive in those individuals where we might do more extensive surgery with greater confidence that the disease has not spread. We need to select patients better and perhaps using biology can inform that for us uh, better. But it's not something we can see. It's something that, that's spat out of a machine. And that's challenging uh, in the way we think about things. We see this in the prognostic factors uh, that we measure Clearance of margins um, in many cancer types is important on outcome, uh, but it really doesn't have an effect on median survival for those early failures because these patients die of metastatic disease. They recur at distant sites. And it's only when you're looking at long-term survival where your actual degree of margin clearance makes a difference, where being 1.5 millimeters away um, is important. 
And so when you look at these prognostic factors, this is a, a final multivariate model of, um, of significant prognostic factors in a cohort of pancreatic cancers, you can see that the actual effect on outcome or the relationship to outcome is fairly mild. If you saw these in chemo, chemotherapy data, you probably wouldn't uh, be very excited. Uh, but nonetheless, we measure those and we measure them after the operation where the horse is already bolted. Can we identify the correct path for our patients preoperatively? We have some markers. People don't like CA199, but we really don't understand that well enough. It's despite millions, if not billions of dollars of investment to identify better biomarkers, still we can't get better than CA199. So really we've got some room to move here and understanding that better with some of the tools uh, that we use uh, with relationship to, uh, to chemotherapy responsiveness and also prognosis uh, after surgery. And so at every stage in this algorithm, you can see in red here, uh, there's an opportunity to refine or improve um, the way we select patients for particular treatments. And this is where pancreatic cancer is, is a model where, where, where we can do this in comparison to other cancers where there's a nice relationship between tumor size, lymph node metastases, outcome, et cetera. In pancreatic cancer, it seems to be the other end of the spectrum. And so detecting these particular differences and understanding what biology uh, is doing to that in a particular individual patient can guide us on, as to how we, uh, we choose, select therapies for them. So a few years back, David Chang, one of the uh, postdocs uh, in the lab now, who's in fact a, a senior lecturer who's joined me here from Australia, uh, did some work on some molecules that are known to be involved with, or we identified roles for them in the metastatic process. So trying to identify those patients that have a tumor whose biology is metastatic. Uh, we can't see it on the scan, but we know that even if we guess, 80% of the time we're going to be right. So can we do that better? And he looked at multiple cohorts through collaboration. And this is, this is teamwork, and this is something we, we need to try and do in a global sense. And bringing together cohorts through, uh, from various different locations, through collaborations, through agreements, through having a beer with them at the pub at the end of the meeting, uh, trying to organize how we bring things together. And actually doing the science uh, is relatively quick and not as challenging as making those negotiations happen, setting those collaborations up. And so we looked at a molecule called S100A4, and it co-segregated with poor response after surgery uh, in a number of different cohorts. Uh, another postdoc in the lab, Emily Colvin, also looked at a molecule called S100A2, again, a similar sort of picture. And when you start to bring those together, and bring them together in a, in a nomogram type sense, uh, Instead of a post-operative nomogram where we measure uh, lymph node status, uh, tumor size, all the usual histopathological prognostic factors after we've done the operation, can we assess those variables that we, know we can detect only preoperatively and use them to inform whether we should or shouldn't be operating on that patient, whether we should be more aggressive on somebody that's, uh, that, uh, that has less probability of being metastatic disease. And if you use these markers, uh, the accuracy is substantially greater than just using the prognostic scores of your operative specimen. And these, the age, tumor size, the location, and these two molecules, we can measure uh, preoperatively. And as proof of concept study, even using EUS FNAs, uh, we can identify these molecules as differentially expressed. And you can see them in brown, and they correlate with the tumor uh, specimen. And so we're working along how we can start to implement this into clinical practice. And then a few years ago, the whole world changed. Um, whilst we're still pursuing that, uh, genomics really took off. And the difference there was the technology, very technology driven. It took 15 years and about $3 billion to sequence one or two individual normal genomes to the point where now we can do a normal genome for about 1,000 pounds, if not less, and do it in a couple of days. And so all of a sudden, we were, we were faced in a situation where we had access to this technology and we could start to inform disease. And where better to start than with cancer because cancer is a disease of the genome. So next generation sequencing was able to map out all the genetic abnormalities we see in cancer in general. Anything from small nucleotide changes, uh, mutations, through large insertions, deletions, chromosomal losses, et cetera. And so uh, we became part of the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which formed really in 2007, 2008, read, led by a fellow called Tom Hudson from uh, Ontario, the OICR. Really 24 countries coming together 
to map out all the genetic aberrations amongst the most common or most important for each society's uh, tumour uh, cancer type. Uh, Australia, we were tasked with pancreatic cancer. Um, uh, other countries did specific cancers um, uh, based on their local um, state. In the Indians did buccal cancer with regard to, uh, to chewing tobacco uh, and tobacco type products. China did gastric cancer. I'm sure I'm not surprised that uh, the French did breast cancer and alcohol related liver cancer. Um, which just seems to be important to them. So as the early data started to come in, something we started to realize, or we thought we, we pretty knew, we sort of knew ahead of time, but we didn't realize the depth of this complexity. So whilst we thought about cancer as an individual organ sense, and we can identify it as an organ sense, and it's important from a surgical perspective because you don't want to operate in different organ sites, um, but um, we started to uncover that in fact these were not one disease, even though they looked the same uh, microscopically, they were substantially different. And We'd made some progress in this where we had dominant phenotypes or dominant molecular subtypes, such as ER positive and ER negative uh, in breast cancer, and then subdivided further, luminal A, luminal B, HER2 amplified breast cancer. Basal breast cancer, very hard to treat, very heterogeneous. We can pick some of those molecular subgroups when they occur in more than 10, 15, 20 percent. But as I'll show you in pancreatic cancer, which we seem to have the, the nth degree of heterogeneity, and perhaps that's why we've been so unsuccessful in identifying new treatments, is because we're treating a mix of 20, 30, 50, maybe even 100 different diseases. And so we've known for 1,000 years, since 1025 AD, the second rule of clinical trials is when you test a new treatment, you should test it on a simple, not a compl composite disease. And so I think that may be a reason why we're starting to, or we haven't made much progress. So when we designed our project initially, we did it in a prospective cohort type design. We acquired, uh, we recruited patients, acquired samples prospectively over time, and this is the patient journey. We tracked all these patients through in almost as much rigor as a, as a clinical trial. And then follow the, follow the sample across here through um, sequencing, preparation, and then analysis. And then our responsibility was to put all these data up on the ICGC data portal for the research community uh, to use and to access because the amount of data that we're generating is, is, is ridiculously large. We got to a point where we couldn't send data across to San Francisco uh, in order to get it analyzed because it would take two months on the internet to transfer that data. And if, if those data cor were corrupt one minute before the end, then it was all game over, start again. So we used to put postdocs on the plane with 10 or 20 hard drives and they'd fly across uh, to do that. But uh, computing has changed. Another driver in this is not just the technology, it's the computing ability, the networking ability, and that's also escalating dramatically. So what did we find when we sequenced our first lot of pancreatic cancers? I've alluded to the complexity, and apart from four genes that we've known about for a while, we dropped straight off with this long tail, multiple genes, uh, we don't know whether they're true drivers or they're passenger mutations, but certainly there are some that are starting to float to the top. Uh, but still, nonetheless, what this tells us is that we have a mix of diseases molecularly. And when you represent this graphically, and this is a word cloud or a word all that Mark Cowley, one of the postdocs in the lab, put together, where the size of the gene represents its frequency. So apart from genes we've known for a while, KRAS and that's P16, SMAT4 and P53, you drop pretty much straight to the floor. And that has significant implications to how we look at patients, we treat patients, prognosticate, uh, and now drug selection. It's not just about single, about single nucleotide changes and mutations, it's about big structural rearrangements. Parts of the genome are disappearing, being deleted, uh, translocated, rearranged. Um, and so when you start to map all of these together, you start to get a bit of a picture of molecular, what, molecular what pancreatic cancer is about molecularly. And so uh, genes are inactivated in different ways, which is also extra complexity. Uh, you can't just look at a mutation panel. It's not going to give you the, going to give the, the answers. There's multiple forms of inactivation, again, adding to that level of complexity. But nonetheless, we can start to organize these into uh, mechanistic pathways pathways that are important in uh, cell division, cell maintenance, proliferation, and in cancer dependency. 
And so those 12, 12 core signaling pathways described by um, Bert Vogelstein and Ralph Rubin back in 2008 on their, on their early sequencing study identifies those um, hallmarks of cancer and the pathways that are related to those hallmarks of cancer that are particularly potentially um, uh, druggable. The concept behind this is, is that you've got a mechanism in place and it might not be the same gene that's always broken in that particular pathway. It might be different genes. And how we pull these together in an informed treatment is our current challenge. Uh, we found another pathway, a pathway called axon guidance, and this is an example of how cancers can potentially hijack other mechanisms that are important in, in, normal, uh, in normal physiology. And so axon guidance is a... Uh, a system of uh, signaling pathways that regulate how neurons migrate uh, in the central nervous system during de development. They have to invade, they c communicate with each other, they contact, and they spread. And so perhaps the, either the cancer is using these molecules in a different way or hijacking those, hijacking those particular mechanisms. And even in this pathway, there's interaction between a component of axon guidance, which is Robo 1 and 2, interacting with other well-known cancer pathways like MET, and, uh, and wind signaling. And so you can see in these circumstances, even though a drug makes sense, if you use a MET, MET inhibitor in this particular cancer type, if you've got defects in axon guidance signaling, whatever you do upstream doesn't have an effect. So again, we're getting more and more complex as we move along. Just something I mentioned before we start to move on to patients, and this is something that's started just to come out recently, because we've generated, uh, are able to generate so much data, we can start to look at the patterns of DNA mutation, how uh, nucleotides are changed uh, in order to generate these mutations. And that's important from uh, a perspective of understanding of what causes the cancer as a prelude to, uh, to prevention. And so we see certain signatures that are associated with age. Those that are young children have different mutation spectra compared to the, cancers of older age, uh, we have UV light exposure, uh, thymidine dimers, we have a smoking signature, and understanding those signatures, understanding what's, um, what's happening with those particular molecules, what biochemical processes are going on, can help us start to understand the mechanism of what occurs, and then go back to what is actually driving that particular cancer in a gene environment sense. So when we first started this project, we thought there was no way that we were going to be able to have enough information in time to feed information back to patients. But technology advanced exponentially faster than Moore's law with regard to next generation sequencing. And all of a sudden, I was receiving data off the, the genome sequences from my patients, my colleagues' patients, um, when the patients were still alive or, were, or hadn't recurred yet or were recurring information that I I would think that I would like to know if that, I was that particular patient, and also information that I felt as a clinician, clinician well, this can guide treatment, or, or we've d uncovered a, an unexpected germline BRCA2 mutation. How do we cope with that? And so we restructured things fairly rapidly to be able to, to deal with this, um, uh, this, uh, this change. And so we did two things. We started to um, return information to patients. We started to do... To, to, um, design a clinical trial as to how we might be able to do this. And also, we tested some of these models in, in patient-derived xenografts. So we, from each cancer that we resected, we took a sample and tried to grow it in nude mice or immunocompromised mice. And about 60 or 70% of those grew. So that gave us an opportunity to study that particular individual's patient in that particular, uh, in, uh, in, 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 a, in a mouse. And this, uh, this so-called avatar model has had some recently uh, good publicity. And what we focused on initially was the concept of repurposing or rescuing therapeutics. There are a lot of drugs out there that target specific molecular compounds, uh, specific molecules. Um, pharma are making drugs towards molecules, and we're still thinking about cancer as a histopathological disease. And if, but if we start to identify what those particular targets, even if it's in a different disease, why can't we use the same drug? And we've seen that in Gleevec. Gleevec doesn't just work for GIST, it also works for a number of other uh, cancers, and also works for a number of other diseases uh, as well, benign diseases. And the timeline of development accelerates quite rapidly. This, this was the BCR able for Gleevec took you know, 30 years to develop. Uh, if you look at uh, tamoxifen, for example, tamoxifen sat 
on a bench in ICI for about 10 years before somebody thought about using it for anti-estrogen therapy. And it's probably the most successful uh, therapeutic for cancer, systemic therapeutic ever, ever used. But more recently, if there's a drug already available for human use, you identify a new disease and you target, the timeline is three years for crizotinib in, um, in EMLK4 tra uh, translocated um, lung cancer is an example. And so we started to map the molecular phenotype of every patient that started to come through. We use assays that are available out there looking for these targets for drugs that were used in other, in other, in other cancer types. And so we started to map out uh, the complexity of this cancer from a clinically relevant sense. And when you start to look closer, you can see molecular targets within the cancer. A clinical trial, even though it's ever been performed, will never come out unless you have 10,000 patients. If you've got 2% of an actionable phenotype in your group and you take all comers to detect a difference in 2%, even if it's a great difference, you're going to need 10,000 patients to do it. I've never seen a 10,000 patient pancreatic cancer trial. And when you start to map them out in detail, even though individually these are very small subgroups, 2%, 3%, we don't expect all of them to respond, but um, we, when you add them all together, you're up to 40 or 50 percent. So biting off small amounts at one time and working out how we do that was something we started to pursue. So we divide them into groups where drugs that had shown some signals in clinical trials, uh, approved in some countries for use and reimbursed in some countries for use, uh, had some potential biomarkers of therapeutic responsiveness. We started to explore those. We wanted to rescue some therapeutics, clinical trials that, that didn't come up with a positive result and have been abandoned, um, whereas we see that particular target in a small proportion. And so if you look back and you think at in even phase 1B, phase 1, phase 2A studies, you had one complete responder out of 15 that was thought as a bad drug. And if you look back now and understand the complexity, that in fact is a really good drug. We just need to find the right patients to give it to. Similarly, um, the failure of smoothing inhibitors uh, with regard to uh, inhibiting the hedgehog pathway, we see mutations in, uh, in the hedgehog pathway, but we only see it in about 3 or 4%. So we need to target those patients. And then we see others that are used in other, in other cancers where we see in very low proportion, 1 or 2%. But if, if, if I'm one of those percentages, um, I would want to have that drug. I would want my patient to have that drug. And how we do that is a challenge that we're moving forward with. So if we looked at our cohort of patients that we looked at it as a first pass proof of concept, so we mapped out this molecular phenotype, we weren't able to direct care uh, for our patients apart from a few instances where we returned information to our patients and looked to, to see whether these patients got the right drug for their phenotype. And if you looked at the patients that got the right drug, you got your median survival, um, sorry, that's whether you got chemo or, or, or no chemo at all. If you got chemo, just treat, if you just got chemo for your recurrence, you, you survive 13.5 months. Uh, but if you received your treatment on phenotype, that is you got the right drug, your survival was 21 months. So median survival of 21 months for metastatic disease in pancreatic cancer is almost unheard of. And interestingly, even if you got any drug off phenotype or when you when you, you know, the phenotype was not known, so we don't know whether they got the right drug or not, the median survival was 11.2 months, the median survival of fofurinox in the clinical trial. So, but even more impressive amongst this, amongst the 10 patients that received that, there were six what are called exceptional responders, patients that had complete recurrence of disease, some of whom are living five years down the track. They're a little bit difficult to dissect out because often there's combinations, somebody's done some RFA, and these are patients with liver metastases, some of them that had liver mets ablated uh, or, or just treated based on with their therapeutic. And so based on looking back and understanding what we've done with experiments in cancer in the past, we've looked at extremes of systems. You take your cell line, you take your xenograph, and you, you don't just move your, or you change your genetic um, components of that by a little bit, you just put in bucket loads of one particular uh, gene or you completely ablate the activity of one particular gene. And so we thought we'd take a knowledge bank approach and so rather than those biomarkers that have failed but have strong functional evidence to support them, now that we understand the heterogeneity of pancreatic cancer, why don't we look at these, these outliers? Experiments don't lie, the data are there. Um, we're looking at extremes of experimentation and if we look at 
the extremes of those molecules that are important for transport of gemcitabine, concentration of gemcitabine in the cell, we start to see some dramatic responses. Here's a patient, a patient of uh, David Chang, Chang's my uh, senior lecturer. Um, he didn't want to have gemcitabine on recurrence. He said, doctor, I didn't enjoy it during my adjuvant chemotherapy and I don't think it's done anything because the cancer's come back in eight months. Um, he was an outlier of HENT1. We'd also managed to treat his xenograft um, and he responded re uh, repeatedly. We then got back to the patient and said, well, you probably got a better than a 5% chance of responding. You want to give it a go? And so he did. And so his disease completely regressed. He was completely free of disease for at least nine or 10 months. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't keep taking gemcitabine because of to uh, gemcitabine toxicity. And so then his disease recurred. But nonetheless, he had a dramatic response. If you look at these patient-derived xenografts and you treat them, and you can treat them all with different drugs, you don't get one bite of the cherry, you can see these particular outliers. And this line here, there's a tumor where the tumor grows versus the controls where they, they take off pretty quickly and uh, kill the mouse. Uh, they continuously and repeatedly respond to gemcitabine. Another phenotype we identified is, the, um, is what we call pangenomic instability. We know that PARP inhibitors work in, um, in BRCA2 um, uh, mutant um, cancers, at least in breast cancer. Uh, we see BRCA2 mutations in, in the germline of patients with no family history uh, of, of cancer. Um, but nonetheless, these patients that either have these germline mutations or a surrogate, and this is, for those who haven't seen it, this is a map of a whole genome. It's called a circos plot. These are the chromosomes around the outside. These little wiggles that nobody can see are the small mutations, but these big lines are uh, big chunks of DNA that are falling apart. So you've really got a, a messy or a shredded genome here. And this is representative of a defect in DNA damage repair. And so if we give this, we gave this particular patient a platinum-based chemotherapy, um, which we know um, acts pretty well in ovarian cancer, particularly with there's, a, a geno uh, the, there's um, germline BRCA2 mutations, et cetera. Uh, this patient had a dramatic response. When they recurred, um, and here you can see their recurrence there, uh, they went on Folfox, and so we have complete remission of disease. Uh, even the portal veins we canalized, and this patient uh, is, continues to live on, and I think she's three years down the track. When we start to map out these phenotypes, we start to see differences in the pattern of disease. Um, sometimes patients present with a small pancreatic lesion and with lung metastasis. Um, you don't see that very often. There's a delay in diagnosis. Um, it causes potential problems on recurrence, detecting recurrence. What is it? Carcinoma nine primary, and you draw it down the right down the wrong track. If you look at HER2 amplified pancreatic cancer, you only see it in two percent but they're associated with a particular pattern of metastatic spread. They almost never go to the liver. Uh, it doesn't, almost never metastasize to the liver, metastasize to the lung, and also, on some instances, to the brain. But we never look for those. So we need to be, if we know that somebody's got a HER2 amplified pancreatic cancer, we perhaps need to be more vigilant about symptoms and screen for recurrences in the lung and in the brain, uh, not just uh, in the abdomen. So where do we move ahead from these, uh, from from these early data, this proof of concept, how do we start to, to, to pull together this complexity and, and be able to implement that? So we need to have to start thinking differently. It's driven, a lot of it's driven by regulators, and regulators are talking. They want to start to understand how these systems are changing in order to, for them to respond. There's a lot uh, of benefit to society, not just for patient well-being, but also with regard to economy. If you have a drug that you're giving to 98% of patients where it isn't working, you're wasting uh, cost on drug, you're wasting cost on side effects, um, and not to mention um, uh, bad outcomes for patients. And so understanding these exceptional responders, those outliers, can really give us some fruitful information. In fact, um, it was quite rewarding to hear uh, Harold Barmer speak at AACR, suggesting that we should, we should be sequencing these exceptional responders. We were calling them something different before that. Um, and so we've been doing that for a little while, and really, Going two ways, and this is the new buzzword, instead of bench to bedside, bedside to bench, we use genotype to phenotype and phenotype to genotype. So understanding the underlying molecular pathology, relating it to um, the clinical features and identifying those patients that responded dramatically and then sequencing them. So um, amongst the audience, if you have patients that, you, that had dramatic responses to treatment, um, 
particularly in pancreatic cancer, please get in touch with us. We'd like to know. We're also interrogating uh, biopsies from clinical trials, well annotated clinical trials, working with industry, looking at, those, uh, looking at those samples. Why do those patients respond dramatically? The clinical trial may well have been negative, but amongst them, two or three percent of patients may well have responded dramatically. So that drug's not a complete failure. Now that we understand the disease better, uh, perhaps we can, uh, we can do something with that. We need to work out how we pull together convincing evidence um, so that we can start to implement these things and developing innovative clinical trials, adaptive clinical trials in order to do that. And also uh, pushing things forward with therapeutic development, understanding um, uh, new molecules, how we can potentially target them and using the systems we've developed with regard to patients, patient derived xenografts and genetically engineered mouse models. An example of a clinical trial that uh, we, we we had, just started, we had just started in Australia and we hope to start here is uh, what we call impact. And we randomize patients between what's standard care and at this point in time it's probably not going to be GEM, it's going to be clinician choice versus a personalized approach. That is, we measure or we look at the genome of that individual's cancer, we screen for actionable mutations and we allocate them to a particular drug. Um, just something I'll mention in passing is that Doing a lot of clinical trials, particularly in adjuvant therapy, take a long time, a lot of investment, uh, a lot of energy, um, no results for a long period of time. We need better and quicker uh, surrogate readouts of response. And something we've been working on is looking at circulating tumor DNA. So just like CA199, et cetera, abnormal DNA from tumor cells leaks out into the bloodstream. And then we can use that, um, we can detect that see whether we can, that will track with therapy. It was very early days about understanding whether that actually tracks with therapy or not, but see we can example here of someone with colon cancer where, where you have your circulating DNA tracking with response. So genomics does, has a lot, of, a lot of different applications and how we apply that uh, is the challenge. And I'll just finish off by um, talking about how we're trying to apply this. And really the, the principle of personalized cancer care is getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time for the right cost and with the right outcome. How do we deal with this emerging complexity? We can make some headway into those that have higher proportions of phenotypes, but what if they're scattered like this? And in fact, 70%, if not more, of cancer is like this. We're only, we're only seeing those dominant forms in a very small proportion of cancers across the whole community. We see this complexity, we've got multiple drugs. We've gone from a, an option poor and a um, and an information poor environment to being completely deluged with information, data, and also with, uh, with options and drugs uh, made by pharma. If we adopt the same linear model that we used to in the past, where you have to do all these tests before you're allowed the fancy test, we're never going to manage. Um, all of a sudden, we, we need to test 10,000 know, 10, variables. We, we can't do that. Economically, that's not going to happen. Time-wise, it's not going to happen. And so working things out of how we do things in parallel and changing uh, the, the way we model uh, our healthcare systems with regard to at least cancer and then other diseases uh, it's like um, stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, inf infl inflammatory diseases, etc. And then how do we deliver that information in a digestible form to a clinician? Most clinicians, um, will deal with uh, several different cancer types. Most oncologists will deal with several different cancer types. Um, can you imagine if all of a sudden there's 35 different subtypes of lung cancer? Um, how do we deal with that in a, as a community and how do we present digestible information to treating clinicians? And so um, performing these tests, digesting them, understanding them in some central format and reporting this into a way that the, that the clinicians can act on is, is very important. In fact, the technology, we can do a lot of that technology now. We can sequence this, we can identify actionable mutations, but how do we deliver that information? That's one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges. What about the informatic systems that go with it? We need to be able to communicate, share data. We need to get across over some of those barriers that we have about, about data sharing and some of the fears, many of which are unsubstantiated. Um, one of the uh, the greatest debates we're having at the moment, which I think we've solved, is really whether we can analyze human genome data in the cloud. Um, and I think we're getting past that. But the ability to share these data sets, and I think the, the NHS, particularly in Scotland, has 
has made great moves forward in regard to its information system, and it's one of the most opportune countries to be able to advance some of these approaches uh, in the world. And then you think about things in a knowledge bank. If you, if you can't do a clinical trial, if you've got a subgroup of cancer, say in pancreatic cancer, HER2 amplified pancreatic cancer, there might be 100 people like that in the UK every year. It will take you decades to do a clinical trial in the standard traditional format. What happens if we look deeper and deeper and every, you know, individual cancers are very, very different. There's very small numbers of patients um, that have a particular molecular phenotype. So then how do you change and think about non-clinical trial-based um, approaches? We should stop thinking about the term anecdote and say that doesn't really apply. We should start thinking less about public health um, in the treatment sense, not in the prevention sense, but in the treatment sense. Um, and then think more about personalised health and how do we manage that in our system that has to generalise in order to deliver health care. And so it becomes almost like a meta-analysis of N of 1 clinical trials. Um, if you have a knowledge bank of these patients, you have a patient that comes, comes to see you, they've run out of options. You sequence their tumour, you identify what their molecular phenotype is, you have a knowledge bank of a million two million, three million patients, and these are currently being built. Um, industry is building them. They're working with, uh, with healthcare sectors all around the world to try and work out how we do this. Um, you can interrogate that database and say, I've got Mrs. Smith here. She has this particular cancer. This is a molecular profile. Okay, there's 50 of those on the database. 30 of them received treatments that didn't work, but 20 of them received this particular treatment, and that seems to have worked. So this is the right choice for you. How do we do that? It's, uh, it's, it's easily said, but not easily done. So st the concept of stratified medicine rather than personalised medicine, the sort of bit in between, um, where we treat based on molecular phenotype has lots of distinct advantages, avoids inappropriate therapy, guides research, so we focus our, our research on where, on resistance, combination therapies, etc. Better informed patients and personalise that therapy. And in order to do that, we need to generate systems that will interact between um, different areas and also face those challenges which are more societal rather than technical um, in order to achieve this. And uh, a great step forward announced last week uh, in, uh, by government in Scotland was the Stratified Medicine Scotland, the Innovation Centre, which is going to be based at the Southern General Hospital, really bringing together various parties, uh, stakeholders that are important to pull this together, uh, based at the, uh, at the Southern site, bringing together clinicians, patients, uh, industry, researchers, um, and the healthcare sector because there are so many stakeholders in this and we really have to set up teams to do that. Just like we do team science for big genome projects, now we need greater and greater team healthcare and the previous speaker I think spoke a lot about that as well. So I'll just finish up by, um, by saying that it's, it's, it's a pleasure to get up here and talk about um, some of the work that we're, that we're doing, uh, but it's, whilst I do that there's a lot of people that do this, uh, do this work, big teams, it's team science, got our team, uh, or my previous team back in Sydney, Sean Grimmond, our, uh, my, my partner in crime, uh, the chief sequencer who uh, in fact is moving to Scotland, um, uh, and his team in, in Brisbane, uh, uh, teams at OICR, teams, teams at Baylor, uh, teams at Hopkins, Verona, uh, and elsewhere. And of course our funding bodies, um, and thank you very much.